Okay, everybody. So <clears throat> today's video is going to be about average rates of change, instantaneous rates of change in Leibniz notation. Um, Leibniz notation is, is like uh, when we say for the derivative that it's dy over dx instead of saying it's uh, y prime, okay? Um, in this video, I have a lot of the math worked out already. I'm not going to be doing much of the math. I'll describe what's happening. It will be in the video just because I want you to see it. You can pause the video and look at it if you need to. But I need to think about concepts in this video more than math. All right? So I'll be talking quite a bit, and these slides I have here have quite a bit written on them. Okay, so let's do this. Because I want to get you thinking conceptually, um, I need to understand how calculus begins to fit into science with this topic. I'll ask you to consider a situation that's fairly easy to understand, but I think it's a pretty good situation to get us thinking about why calculus is important, okay? So suppose that I stand close to a wall, let's say 25 feet, and that distance will be fixed. And I shine a laser pointer at the wall, and it makes a dot on the wall. And the dot is like y feet from the ground, okay? And as I shine the laser pointer at the wall, that laser light travels at some direction theta with respect to this horizontal line right here, okay? So, all right, that's the situation. Theta, y, the laser dot, me, the wall, okay? You can think of it as a triangle, as the way I'm describing it. Now, here's where calculus begins to enter the picture. Here's what I want you to think about. How does the position of that dot on the wall depend on any changes to that angle like because you might think of it like i want to shine this laser pointer at the wall and i want to keep it perfectly still but i'm not going to be able to do that i just can't hold my arm that still that angle is going to vibrate a little bit it might go up and down by a degree or so something like that so you know i'm wondering something along these lines that as theta there fluctuates or vibrates by a matter of degrees up or down, does that distance here, where the laser is on the wall to the ground, y, does that uh, jump up and down by a matter of inches or by a matter of feet or something like that, okay? So something along those lines is what I'm wondering about. And of course, like that's the answer, that's a number. Like it might be that if theta jumps up and down by a degree, then y might jump up and down by one and a half feet or something like that, okay? Change in this thing is definitely going to cause some kind of measurable change in that other thing, all right? Another way to say that is we might wonder how sensitive is y to changes in theta? y is definitely going to change if theta changes, but we might wonder how sensitive it is to it. Is it going to change a lot or a little bit? Or can we measure it? All right. So, all right. So most of this video is going to be about how we could measure that. Um, but the answers would depend on many things. So here's here's my instinct about it. I, I wonder if you have the same instinct. Try and think about, about how that would work. If theta is large, looks like somebody's here. Hold on. Okay, so back to it. Um, the answer depends on many things, like, so if theta is large, like, say that this is not just a wall, but it's a very tall building, and if I stand 25 feet away from it, I could, like, almost point the laser straight up, you know, not 90 degrees, obviously, but, uh, you know, maybe 80 degrees or 75 degrees or something like that, then here's what I think will happen. I think Y will be very sensitive to changes in theta, so that's my instinct. Maybe you have the same instinct. If theta is small, okay, so... I don't know, like maybe 10 or 20 degrees, then Y will uh, be much less sensitive to changes in theta. So those are two factors that would influence the magnitude of our answer. If we want to measure how sensitive Y is to changes in theta, those are a few factors that are going to play into the answer. Uh, there are others, like such as how close you are to the wall, but at least in, in my problem, I'm going to hold that fixed at 25 feet. It's going to be a constant. 
Uh, you know how I've talked uh, in other videos throughout the semester that if such and such is a constant, the rule says to do this or that. Uh, well, 25 feet, that's a constant. It's going to be 25 feet no matter what. That's not changing, okay? All right, so there's the situation. Now, so far, I haven't done any math. I haven't asked you to do any math. I haven't told you what the questions are going to look like. I just want you to think about this situation, okay? Uh, of course, like, I can't force you to understand calculus if you don't want to, but if you wanted to understand uh, its application and its meaning, then thinking about questions like that is, uh, I think, a good way to begin. Now, here I'll begin the math. I'll tell you how the questions are going to be, okay? So take the same situation, me shining the laser pointer at the wall, all the same variables defined, and so on. And suppose I want you to calculate delta y over delta theta if theta is 10 degrees and theta changes by half of a degree. And delta y over delta theta if theta is 80 degrees and theta changes by half of a degree. Now, like I told you, I've worked this out already. I'll explain to you now uh, how I'll do that. But those are the answers you're going to get. When theta is small, what this is like saying for every one degree change in the angle, theta will, or y will change by a little less than half a foot if the angle starts off at 10 degrees. Okay? And then here, if theta is much bigger, notice that change is the same. It's changing by the same amount either way. But if theta is 80 degrees, then a 1 degree, because this is over 1, all right? Okay, I'll show you in a minute how I got that number, but that's over 1. A 1 degree change in the angle will cause y to jump by 15 feet, a little over 15 feet. So yeah, the way y responds to changes in theta depends on what theta is to start with. All right? Now, uh, for vocabulary, uh, you know, here's the way it's going to be. That I'm trying to pack in a lot of stuff in the video, um, like it or not. I just It's all there, and it's calculus, and some people find it complicated, but I'll quit apologizing for it. You could call either of these the average rate of change of y with respect to theta just as a matter of vocabulary, all right? So how did I find those, like, when I got those answers? Okay, well, so if I'm going to measure changes in y from some given changes in theta, or changes in y caused by some changes in the angle theta, then I need a formula that relates the two of those. Like, there's got to be some formula that connects y to theta. Like, if you knew theta was 10 degrees, could you figure out what y is? Well, yeah, we can use trigonometry to do that. We have a right triangle, tangent of an angle such as that one, and a right triangle is opposite over adjacent. If I multiply by 25, I get a function where theta is the input and y is the output. So that's the kind of thing I need to tabulate delta y over delta theta. I need some formula that connects the two of those. Uh, to give more technical jargon for this, we would say y is a function of theta. Theta is the independent variable, and y is the dependent variable, okay? All right, so say I get that. Then I, in my videos, I always use a table. You don't have to do it that way, but it's. It, I think it's a nice way to present it, okay? So what was that first one? Theta is 10 degrees and changes by a half of a degree. So it goes from 10 to 10.5. As a result, y is 25 tangent 10 degrees feet. Okay, there are units to consider when we are doing uh, science, okay, or applications of math. And then here, y is 25 tangent 10.5 feet. Okay, so the change in y over the change in theta is going to be this y value minus that one. There they are over this theta value minus that one. That literally is the change in y the difference, subtract them to get change over the change in theta. Now remember, these are measurements and they do have units. And just as your science teacher would get uh, perhaps aggravated if you didn't keep track of your units, like here, if units are involved, if our problem is about measurement, we gotta keep track of what the measurements are made with. So that top one was y. That was the height of the triangle. That's measured in feet. So that top unit is feet over the bottom one. Uh, that was degrees, so it's degrees, okay? 
Now, this number right here, that's kind of like saying, uh, like if you drove your car and you kept track of your mileage and your time, it's like saying you drove 120 miles in two hours, okay? That might be true, but we would reduce that uh, by dividing out the numbers and keeping the unit. So instead of saying that you drove 120 miles in two hours, you would probably just say my average speed was 60 miles per hour. So what I'm going to do from here is kind of like that. I'm just reducing the number component of my problem. So if I divide 0 0.225 by 0 0.5, I'll get 0 0.451 feet per degree. Remember, it was feet over degrees. Y is measured in feet. Theta is measured in degrees. And you could give even that different units depending on what your preference is. Like if I convert uh, feet to inches, 12 inches per foot, then that would all, could also be said 5.4 inches per degree, okay? All right, so that's how I got this number. I gave the feet per degree number, 0 0.451 feet per degree. So yeah, if the angle's 10 degrees and it moves a little bit, then that Y is going to move around to about half a foot per degree or about 5.4 inches per degree, okay? And this other number, I would find that the same way, okay? Uh, here's my table. There are my calculations for the change in y over the change in theta. I treat the units exactly the same way. You could say 15.2 feet per degree, or if you wanted inches, 182.7 inches per degree. Now, we're not too surprised about either of these numbers. Maybe you didn't know what they were, but didn't I try to get you uh, in agreement with my instinct that the higher that angle is, the more sensitive Y is to changes in that angle. The more that point jumps around up there as this angle vibrates. So yeah, we said that the, the, the higher up you point that, the more that's going to jump around. Well, so look at this one. You know, that's a, obviously a smaller number than this. Imagine it moving around by half a foot versus 15 feet if the angle is 10 and vibrates a little bit versus if it's 80 and vibrates a little bit. Okay. Now, remember, that's the math is not so much the focus of the video. Uh, you know, the math is important, but the concepts are important too. So I've showed you the math and so on. I really want to get everybody in the class to have as good instincts about math as possible. So I, I went even further and I drew these diagrams where I'm, you know, with measurement here. I got my protractor and I measured all this stuff. It's not just a, a drawing for the sake of example. Everything is measured here. So I started with a 20 degree angle because that's fairly easy to draw with my protractor. And I said, well, I wonder if I can show everybody if I start at 20 degrees and the angle changes by a little bit, that I can show them how why that vertical distance on the wall would change. So those are indicated in red, but my picture indicates if theta is 20 and it changes by 5 degrees, I use 5 degrees just because it's, it's hard to draw much smaller than that with my protractor, that you can see delta y if theta is 20 and it changes by 5 degrees then that's the change in the y. You can see it. I would say delta y is fairly small compared to this one, okay? Here, if theta began at 70, I changed it by a half of a degree. I added a half of a degree to it, and then here's the change in y there. I can see that in that case, when the angle is bigger to start with, y is much more sensitive to changes in theta. Uh, delta y is fairly large there. Okay, so I hope that that... Uh, helps you understand what we're talking about even better, all right? I'll give you all kinds of ways to think about it. You'll have to take away from it uh, what works best for, for you, what fits into your understanding the best, okay? Okay, so next example. So I'm going to keep using that situation because I've already talked about it quite a bit. I want to get the most out of this I can to explain calculus. So I'm going to use the same example, but my question this time is, given that example that we've already discussed, can you calculate dy over d theta for different given values of theta? Okay, so just the way that this works, I'll say, I'll say this much about it. I'll try to give you all the information a little bit at a time. So 
in order to find dy over d theta, that's a derivative, I need that top variable y to be a function of that bottom variable theta. And that's true for every derivative. If I wanted, say, for some other problem, dr over dt, then just in general terms, in order to find that, I need r to be a function of t. I need some kind of formula where I can plug in t and do all the math, and it will calculate r, okay? So if, if the question says, what's dy over d theta? Then I need y to be a function of theta, okay? But we already found that. We found that a true equation for this situation is that tangent theta is y over 25, and then that could be reduced this way. And that is putting uh, y to be a function of theta. You plug in theta, you get y. Theta is the input, y is the output. So dy over d theta is just the derivative of that with whatever rules are applicable. Now, before we got into all this stuff, the applications and the concepts, we just learned the rules. So here's where those rules are going to come into effect. Okay. All right. Now, so if you're going to calculate each of these, there's the answers that you're going to get. I guess you could try to do that now if you wanted to without me showing you. I'm, I do need to show you and I'll do that and then I'll come and talk about some of this other stuff. So dy over d theta is just the derivative of 25 tangent theta. So look at this before I come back to that slide that I was just on. So there's our function, here's our derivative. dy over d theta is the derivative of 25 tangent theta. If y equals 25 tangent theta. What do our rules say the derivative of tangent theta is? It's secant squared. What do we do with the 25? Well, in this case, a constant is brought down. So it's 25 secant squared. Now, if you want dy over d theta, when theta is 10 degrees, because wasn't that the question? This says, what is the derivative dy over d theta when theta is 10 degrees? Or in the next one, what's dy over d theta when theta is 80 degrees? Okay. Well, all right. So we take 25 secant squared theta and we put 10 degrees in. It's not so bad. Uh, since secant is 1 over cosine, I could calculate this as 25 over cosine of 10 degrees then squared. All right. And you'll get this number, 25.777. Now, uh, a derivative will have units. If your variables are involved in a situation where they are measured, such as y, the distance from here to here, in feet, in theta, an angle, which could be measured in degrees or radian, then your derivative will have those units. The units of dy over d theta will be in, well, how do we measure y? y is a distance, feet in this problem. In theta, what's theta? Theta is an angle. How do you measure angles? Well, you could use radians or degrees, okay? Now, when I divide that out and I get this number, this part will be perhaps maybe a little surprising to you. Uh, it will just be something that I'm not gonna explain right now. I'm gonna ask you to accept. So this is what you're going to get by default, okay? And here's what I mean. If we have the derivative of some trig function, like theta is an angle, secant squared theta, uh, tangent theta, then that default measurement you're going to get is going to be radians. So when you calculate that number, the units for theta are going to be radians as a, a just default purpose, okay? Now, why the units for that will be however you are measuring distances in the setup of the problem, which was feet in our example, okay? All right, so we'll do the math here. We'll get that number, all right? But this being the derivative of a trig function with respect to an angle, the default is going to be radian. Now, I don't like uh, saying feet per radian. It doesn't seem to get the idea across. I can much better imagine that a one degree change in the angle causes 14.5 feet of movement up and down. So degrees are much more natural for people to think about. So I don't want to give you units in radians, okay? And I don't want you to give me units in radians. So we'll convert feet per radian to feet per degrees. That's got to be possible because uh, 
you know, a radian measurement for an angle converts to degrees, there's your conversion factor. One radian is 180 over pi degrees, okay? So there I've got, like, this is 25.777 feet over one radian. There, one radian is 180 over pi degrees. Divide that out, there's your number, 0 0.450 feet per degree. For the other one, it's done the same way. What's dy over d theta when theta is 80 degrees? Okay, let theta be 80 degrees. Do the math. The default there is going to be radians. You convert it to degrees the same way as up there. You'll get 14.47. Okay, so those are the answers that I showed you here. Okay, now another thing I need to tell you, and I told you there's a lot that I need to tell you. Okay, and I'll be re repeating these themes in the videos so that it doesn't sink in when you hear it once, maybe it will as you keep hearing it, is it's true that dy over d theta is the limit as delta theta goes to zero. So this, in the last test, this was the f of x plus h thing minus f of x over h as h goes to zero. But now when we're talking about measurements and their changes, you could think of the derivative as the limit as that bottom change goes to zero, okay? As a result, or you could say like the derivative is the limit as the bottom change goes to zero of the average rate of change. Now, as a result, if you let this not go to zero, but if you just let it be small, then the derivative is approximately equal to the average rate of change, okay? Now, I want to illustrate that that's actually true. So what was delta y over delta theta when theta was 10 and delta theta was half of a degree? That's a fairly small change. We got 0 0.45 feet per degree when we just measured it and divided it. So what did we get here? 0 0.45. Now, I would say those are close, okay? All right, that's, you would expect that to happen. What about this other one? What's dy over d theta when theta is 80? I got 14.5 feet per degree here. And when I calculated the deltas and divided them, I got 15.2. Well, those aren't as close as that first example, but they're still close, all right? And that's what we would expect. Now, um, again, let me remind you some vocabulary. These dy over d theta, the derivatives, those are going to be called the instantaneous rates of change of y with respect to theta. And to really show you why the word instantaneous is used, well, notice the root of that word is instant, and that's uh, referring to time. So we'll need to do some problems that involve time. But in another video uh, about motion and time, I'll explain that, okay? So yes, those are the instantaneous rates of change. Uh, you could also say it's the derivative of y with respect to theta. And here's another thing I wouldn't want you to miss when you learn calculus. Why do we say with respect to theta? Why do we say the rate of change of y with respect to theta? Well, it's not just that y is changing. It's not just that that distance right there just decides to change on its own. It changes because of the theta. It changes because the theta changes. So we could say just as a brute fact about this problem that any change in that angle is going to cause change in that vertical distance or the location of that spot. So it's not just that y changes, it changes with respect to theta, or it changes because of theta changing, okay? So when we use this word res with respect, which you'll hear in all throughout calculus and physics, uh, that's why we're using it. There's a cause and effect between y and theta and their changes, okay? So here's one more thing to think about. This will be the last thing for, for this video, at least. Uh, it's if the, let's see, if the deltas are fairly approximate to the derivatives, why do we have to learn both?
Okay. And that's a question that you should ask. And I, I hope that you would think about asking that even if I didn't bring it up. But because I'm hoping that that's the case, I'm going to bring it up and answer it for you. So, if the derivative, the instantaneous rate of change, is approximate to the average rate of change, if the delta x, if the change in x is small. Now, y and x here are just generic variables. I know in my other problem I was using y and theta, but they're variables. They'll be different depending on the situation, but they're just variables. It doesn't really matter what you call them. Uh, so, if these are close to each other, then why do we learn both? Okay. If we could just use this one all the time, then why do we learn that one? And vice versa, I guess you could say. Uh, well, okay, so here's here's one answer. There's, of course, I could talk about this for 45 minutes, but I'll give you a quick answer to it that will, I hope, enlighten what we're doing a little bit more. Uh, Newton's second law of motion says that force is mass times acceleration. Okay, uh, if you want to know the force, you need to know the acceleration. I guess you could think of it like that. But when we say acceleration, that's a derivative, actually. Okay, It's an instantaneous rate of change. It's not an average rate of change. Okay, I guess you could say acceleration is the change in your velocity with respect to time. But for the sake of this law of nature to describe observations accurately, Acceleration is an instantaneous rate of change. It's a derivative, in other words. Okay? So, you know, maybe the deltas are easier, and we might not want to learn the derivative, but the derivative is what more accurately describes uh, what we observe in nature some of the time. Okay? So, all right, that's why we learn the derivative. And you could say, well, if we learn the derivative, why don't we learn the delta? Why do we learn the deltas too? Well, because the derivative is based on that. You know, to find the derivative, I guess tech, what that really is, is you calculate the deltas, but you let the bottom one go to zero. Like you let it, that, that change down there be so small that it's almost non-existent. Okay, that's what the derivative is. So, you know, we learn the derivative because... It's what describes nature, such as in Newton's second law of motion. And we learn the deltas because, one, if we don't have the function and we need to make measurements of changes, we can do that also. And two, that, well, the derivative is based on the deltas. Okay. All right. So that'll wrap it up. I'm fitting a lot of stuff in one video. This stuff, I'll bring it up in others. As I said, I hope that if it doesn't totally sink in the first time you hear it with the first type of problem, as you keep seeing the other problems, it will, in your mind, begin to come together.